I'm ready if you are. All right. Let's go ahead and uh, get started. Welcome, everyone. Um, as always, you know, great to have everyone join us. Uh, appreciate everyone taking time, you know, out of their busy schedules and their day to, you know, join us for the webinar. Um, this is our, uh, you know, kind of series of webinars. We've talked uh, early on about, you know, conditioners, um, you know, modern trends, mm -hmm. pattern sheets, uh, how to read program sheets, kind of putting it all together. But at the end of the day, as we've kind of talked, you know, previous, um, the program sheet's a program sheet. At yep. the end of the day, uh, those numbers, what's on the lane is what's on the lane. And if your machine isn't doing what it's supposed to be doing or functioning and adjusted or wear items, you know, uh, that program sheet's not going to play the way it's intended to play on the lane. So today, really, we want to go through and kind of make sure you know what adjustments are pertinent to making sure that program sheet plays well. Uh, when to change, you know, change some of your wear items, you know, that type of stuff. Uh, that's always important, you know, so we certainly want to cover that. Joining me again today is Mr. Doug Dukes, um, you know, super sales slash uh, technician, lane man, just got back from the U.S. Open a little yeah. while ago. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Gus Falging. I'm uh, vice president at sales for Kegel. So, um, again, welcome. Anything to talk about here, Dougie? Yeah, I mean, before we get started, you know, one of the things I usually lead in when we do this seminar is you've all been to that bowling center that always has great scores. <laughs> you know, they're the people that talk about they've never changed their pattern for the last you know, year, two years, three years. Um, I can guarantee you most of the centers that do that follow all the protocols that we're going to put in place today. So they're always adjusting their machine. They're always checking adjustments and everything is always the same, which means your lanes are always the same and your bowlers can come in and, you know, stand in the same place and do the same thing just about every time. So, yeah, I mean, we're lucky. I mean, you know, pretty much all the events we do, we're using, you know, brand new machines, um, you know, so we're always, you know, sure. at peak performance, you know, all that. I always like to say I love selling parts, <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. you know, but at the end of the day, you want to make sure you get the lifespan of your parts. And I want you to replace your parts because they wore out based upon just simple wear, not because of neglecting a part or exactly. dirt or maintenance that is causing you to have to change parts more often. So we'll kind of talk a little bit about that because at the end of the day, we want you to get that lifespan out of those those parts. Sure. And so. then we'll, uh, we'll obviously follow up with certain adjustments <clears throat> or certain things that you want to look for. Um, you know, to fix problems that you may see in your center, such as drips or or things like that, that can be fixed typically with just a very simple adjustment on the lane machine. So, um, you know, once again, if you listen to our previous seminars, um, walking lanes and looking for things, now you can tie all this together and what you need to look at on the lane machine versus what you see on the lanes themselves. Yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, I mean, you know, making, you know, press the button and let it go, yeah. but um, the more you are paying attention and listening for the nuances of your machine, the more you are walking up and down the lanes, the more you'll catch something that maybe doesn't sound right or you're like, mm, that looks a little bit different than normal. So those are procedural things that help you maintain, you know, your lane machine, um, you know, so that at the end of the day, that season or, you know, those wear items again, you know, you don't. You know, maintenance is important, which you'll talk about. I mean, you know, uh, it's very keeping important. a clean lane machine at the end of the day is, I mean, the cleaner, the more, you know, you take care of that, the the better off you're going to be and the happier your bowlers will be or as happy as bowlers can be sometimes. So. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, let's start uh, us off here, we'll my go man. Go ahead and get started. So basically the presentation today is going to be, you know, understanding your lane machine and the secrets to consistency. Um, and as we spoke about earlier, consistency can be from a lot of things and, and it can transfer from walking your lanes and seeing something and, and immediately knowing where to look on the lane machine. Um, or just as you're wiping the lane machine down, knowing what to look for, knowing what mm -hmm. adjustments to check. Um, as we spoke about in our previous seminars, uh, the program sheets only as good as, as what, what your, your lane machine is doing, doing. exactly um, so we're going to try to make it so that what's actually on that 
PDF of that, you know, pattern sheet is going to be what's on your lane itself. So more common than not, um, typically when we get called into a center to do service work or things like that, um, we sometimes don't see the best looking equipment. Um, and that's why we got called in because bowlers are having a problem. They're complaining. Centers are down in revenue. Um, so they want to get it fixed immediately. So hopefully um, for everybody that's here today, um, some of your machines do not look like this. Um, and if they do, then hopefully you'll go back after the seminar and you know, we'll start to uh, clean them and make them better. But I'm assuming if you're taking the time to be at the seminar today or the webinar, you know, that your machines probably look much better than, than what we see here. Um, yeah, I mean, we've seen, you know, we've all been there where, you know, been in a bowling center, lane machine's been in six months and it looks like it's, you know, yeah. 20 years old or, you know, it just uh, like, wow, you know. And then, of course, we've been in the centers that, you know, 15 year old machines that look like the Brand day, new. you know, the day they got them. So, you know, at, again, at the end of the day, I mean, if your machine looks like this, your pattern and certain things aren't going to, you know, have the right oil or the wrong oil. Yeah. It doesn't matter at that point. <laughs> exactly. Um, and one thing that you'll notice about our machines, especially for those of you that have been running them for a long time, they're going to do the same thing regardless of whether they're clean or they're dirty that the, the cushion roller is going to go down and the cloth is going to unwind. Mm -hmm. The head's going to go back and forth. And as long as all the sensors are working, that machine is going to go up and down the lane. Um, now, whether the oil gets to the lane the way it's supposed to, once again, depends on how you maintain it. So if you look at these pictures here, you know, I can tell you that the, the first picture you see on the left where you see, you know, all the trash that's on that transfer brush, that oil is not going to get to the buffer brush or to the lane either at all or when it's supposed mm -hmm. to. Um, the vacuum motor that you see here, you know, that's probably going to sound like a jet airplane taking off and it's not going to suck up the chemical that it needs to suck up when you're cleaning. And you're going to wind up replacing that probably in less than half the time. Exactly. You should. Exactly. If you take a look at, you know, obviously the next pictures, um, there's a couple transfer brushes. Now, the one that you see on the left is from our new setup, which is a single transfer mm -hmm. brush. Um, and believe it or not, this particular picture, um, this machine was spotless. I mean, you were with me when, when we actually took this picture. Yeah. Um, and, and it was just from lack of knowledge on exactly what to clean. So they cleaned the front of the transfer brush. The mm -hmm. entire machine was immaculate, but they never reached their hand underneath of it to clean the, the inside the of the transfer side. brush. Yep. Um, so once again, you know, not going to put out the pattern as it is on the program sheet. Um, the one center picture, the one next to that, um, that's actually a dual transfer brush from from one of our old setups, and there's probably enough stuff in there to fill a 32 ounce Pepsi cup, which I've done on multiple occasions, um, especially when we look at things like filters, um, you know, coming out of your vacuum hoses and things like that. I've flushed those lines out and been able to fill a you know 32 ounce Pepsi that, cup with all the stuff. Again, that's I mean in there. that filter, you know, on the right is going to cause your back motor to have to work, yep. going to draw more amperage if you got a battery machine. You're going to lose lanes because you're you're draining those batteries, exactly. you know, and you got transfer brushes that look like that. You know, you're going to wear out your buffer brush. Yep. I mean, it's just going to happen. So the more dirt collects more, it just winds up, you know, taking those wear items and having to replace them more often than than you should. And that that filter, if I'm not mistaken, just a quick fact, weighed about seven and a half pounds when we took it out. I yes. mean, it's it was amazing. And, you know, once again, it came off the vacuum motor that we saw in the previous <laughs> picture. So we know what that all does to the machine. Yep. So hopefully nobody mm -hmm. has a machine that looks like that. Obviously we're going to show the worst case scenarios. Um, but every time I go into a center, there's always something that I see that I could clean a little better or, you know, change around a little bit. Um, and hopefully the mechanics, when we go into centers, you know, take those tips to heart. So, we're going to talk a little bit about adjustments and one of the most common adjustments um, that we get a call for in the tech office is actually your end of lane adjustment. So what we're looking for is a machine to actually go off or the squeegees to go off the end of the tail plank. Um, if it doesn't go off the end of the tail plank, the blades don't get cleaned as they should. Um, and you'll, you'll end up getting, you know, out of ranges, things like that. Um, so the two calls that we get in the tech office are obviously out of ranges, number one, mm -hmm. um, and drips on the approach, number two. Um, and it all comes from your end of lane adjustment. So 
basically, if you look at the machine, the easiest way to check it without having to crawl into your pin deck is to look at the rear of the machine, and it should be around the two, three pin spots. That typically means that the squeegee blades are off the, uh, you know, the end of the pin deck, and they're going to help clean themselves. Um, and then you're not going to drip on your approach or get sliding pins. Um, you know, obviously something else that you'll want to look at is your battery operated machines. They do something called a squeegee wipe. And we do that on purpose. Now, while it takes a couple extra seconds a lane, um, you know, obviously that helps clean the blades off so that they don't drip on the approach because mm -hmm. we shut the vacuum off on Correct, the way back, back so. to save on battery. Um, so if you do have a larger center and, you know, you do turn that squeegee wipe off to save a couple minutes, be aware that you'll, you'll just want to make sure that you follow up on the approach to make sure that you don't mm -hmm. have any drips anywhere. Something else that we see a lot of times is the squeegee adjustment. Um, so typically, you know, your squeegees we recommend depending on the size of the center, but we're going to average it on a 32 lane center just for the, the purpose of this webinar. Um, we recommend changing your squeegee blades, flipping them about every six months and changing them once a year. Um, there are two different adjustments for those of you that have different style machines. So all the machines that were previous to the flex, um, we want that squeegee to be adjusted one eighth to three sixteenths, mm -hmm. basically. Unless you have some topography issues that exactly, you know, those are guides, just yep. like on your pin set or pin spotters. I mean, sometimes you know you're a little bit out, but for the most part, if you're within these parameters, you should be good. Exactly, and, and all of our machines from here are usually set at an eighth of an inch. We try to go at the minimum for all of our adjustments, um, obviously to prevent wear and, and amperage on battery machines and things like that. Um, but this is obviously when we go to events, um, like I was just at the U.S. Open, the first thing that we do is run a clean only on the lane machine. So set it an eighth of an inch. If your topography is good, typically we're going to pull yeah. everything up. Um, you may see that some centers you may get a, you know, strip that's left over in the center of the lane or, or something along those lines, especially certain surfaces that are dished. And you may need to drop those squeegees just a little bit. Um, just to be aware, if you go too far, and get that vapor trail. Exactly. We get A, the vapor trail, and B, we get, uh, obviously, if we go way too far, we can get lines on the lane, almost like the squeegees aren't doing their job or, well, or are too light. You'll get it down so far that liquid won't get to the trap yep. blade. Exactly. So. Um, and you'll actually see the, the lines going down the lane of the squeegee blade. So for those of you that have flex machines, um, there's a, a little bit of difference there. We're looking at 3 sixteenths to a quarter of an inch. And the reason for that is the LDS or secondary drive wheels on all of our other machines are at the rear of the machine. For the flex, it's more toward the center of the machine, which basically changes the pivot point of the machine. So we need a little bit more pressure um, to be able to get everything to get clean. Now, to make that adjustment, um, what you want to do is actually put your you know, squeegee in the down position. And then if you look at the center picture, you'll see that we have a bracket here that we want to loosen up the two um, quarter 20 nuts, and then we can slide the entire squeegee assembly forward or backward to be able to get our adjustment. And if we look at the adjustment, it's going to be from your drive wheels to your LDS, and we want basically, when we lay it over the squeegee blades, we want the, either the eighth or three sixteenths gap on our drive wheels. One other thing that we want to look at um, is obviously our squeegee cam. We want to make sure that, especially for those of you that have older machines, the custodians, custodian pluses, um, or, or even older than that, ion model Bs possibly, um, we want to make sure that that cam is nice and tight. What happens over time is, you know, the, the motor only has basically a quarter inch shaft. So from all that pressure going on lane after lane after lane, you get 100,000 lanes in there, that shaft may start to wear a little bit and that cam's going to wear a little yep. bit. Um, when that happens, it can actually make your squeegees kind of stop in different places. So then you'll have cleaning problems from that. And the final thing that we would look at is the picture on your left, which is your pitch adjustment. Mm -hmm. um, so as Gus spoke about the vapor trail, um, that can come from a couple things. It can come from the squeegees being crushed too much or your pitch not being square, um, which can cause that vapor trail to, to be behind the machine. Also, too, if you're lowering them or erasing them, you know, that turnbuckle can be too long or too short sure. and not allow that cam to make its full or bind it, lock it up, which I've yeah. seen. And then, you know, you wind up tearing up the motor or that set screw strips out. So if you adjust that, you want to, we want to make sure that that adjustment. But 
like pitches, we pretty much set them so that's pretty much should be square to Correct. your to your blades, like you saw in the previous picture. If you're you know pitched here, pitched there, sometimes you know you want to make sure you try to square those up as best as possible. Exactly. Unless there's an extreme again. Right. I mean, there's you know certain scenarios, but for the most part, you know if that adjustment is right and you're square, you should be should be okay. And that's probably one of the uh, factors that I see we get calls in the tech office when they've gone to adjust squeegee blades. They adjust the height from the turnbuckle instead mm -hmm. of adjusting it from where they're supposed to on the side of the machine. Um, so you want to be very careful with that, um, especially if you're a new mechanic or, or you know, new to our lane machines. You want to make sure that you adjust it from the right place. Um, and once again, when you do your clean onlys, which we'll talk about later, um, I'm a firm proponent of always walking directly behind the lane machine. So you'll see when we do events, a lot of times we'll walk, you know, a foot or two behind the lane machine as it's going down the lane. Um, if you wait until the lane machine comes back to you and then go and check that lane surface, if there was a vapor trail, it's yeah. going to be gone. Or if you did leave liquid, the buffer brush yeah. obviously is applying over the top, so you might might not even see it. So always want to walk directly behind when, when you're doing those clean onlys um, to make sure that there is no vapor trail there. The cushion roller. So this is probably um, one of the most overlooked things on a lane machine. Um, Probably seven times out of 10 when we get a call into the office um, for a machine not cleaning properly, they've told us that they've already changed the squeegee blades. Mm -hmm. um, they have not, however, even looked at the cushion roller. And the cushion roller, believe it or not, is really what does 70 to 80% of your cleaning. Um, the squeegee blades just kind of pick up all that yeah, dirty water and, and whatever's like left over. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you definitely want to keep an eye on these. Um, typically, we recommend no matter the size of the center, changing it once every 12 months. Um, you know, you can stretch this out, make it go a little bit longer. In the flex machines, um, the cushion roller will actually, once you're done with your lanes, the cloth will unwind a little bit. It'll take the pressure off the roller. Um, for those of you that have, uh, you know, sport model machines, ion model Bs and up, if you just, uh, you know, flip your, your front lid down when you get done with your lanes, you can slide your dirty roll to the side and unwind it 180 degrees. That'll take the pressure off your cushion roller. Um, and for those of you that have older machines such as the Custodians or Phoenix S's, um, a lot of times what I would do is push the button on the handle like I'm going to run another lane um, and then turn the machine off. And that'll let the, you know, mm -hmm. obviously let all that pressure off your cushion roller. I mean, especially, you know, that really comes into play if, you know, you don't run your lane machine every sure. day. You know, exactly. when you're doing it every day, it kind of not a big deal. But if you're not doing it every day or, you know, maybe you're closed for the summer yep. or, you know, a, an extended period of time, you know, it, you'll certainly develop some flat spots in that in that roller. No question. And one of the things that I like to look at when I talk to people about the cushion roller is actually the lines on your cloth itself. So. A big thing that I do when I got calls in the tech office, um, you know, I would tell somebody when you change your, your cloth, unwind that dirty roll just a little bit. And it's almost like growth rings on a tree. All those lines should be fairly even spaced apart and they should all be about the same thickness. Mm -hmm. um, if you happen to see that you're thick, 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 you know, thin, 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 um, you may have a flat spot on your cushion roller because as that roller turns, mm -hmm. you know, you're not getting the lanes as clean. So when a bowler says, Hey, you know, I bowled here yesterday and same pattern, same everything and back ends were great. And I bowled here today and it just wasn't the same. There may be something to that, um, you know, and typically you'll get that flat spot after, you know, 12, 18 months, um, depending on what you're doing, if you're just putting the machine away. Mm -hmm. But if you take the time to loosen that up, very, very important thing to do. It'll make that part last a lot longer and Absolutely. being able to, you know, to look at those those lines on that on that cloth when you take that cloth off it's going to tell you when you need to change that roller as well um, for those of you that do change it um, this is the 8839 cushion roller um, originally they were white up until i guess about what 12 months ago mm -hmm. maybe um, so if you order the new one now it's going to be the same type of roller same everything but uh, your wrap is going to be black and it's going to be attached to the yeah. roller itself so don't think that you got the wrong part number or, or you had a wrong shipment that is a change that we made here correct so obviously i'm going to show you a, a couple pictures of cushion rollers themselves 
um, and what looks good and what doesn't. So these are actually pictures from the field. Um, these are a couple machines that I've worked on. But if you look at the picture on the left, um, you know, you'll see the cushion roller that I took out of the machine is the one that's on the left side of that picture. And it looks OK. You know, it, it's round. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's not, you know, oblong, didn't have any flat spots on it, no cracks or anything like that. But if you look at the brand new cushion roller to the right of it, obviously you're going to see that that roller is about 50 percent bigger than the one I took out of the machine. We've actually gotten calls or I've got, you know, been there and they're They'll call and they're like, I think I got the wrong part because <laughs> yeah. it doesn't look like the, what they took off. I'm like, well, yeah, it's the same part. It's just that's how, exactly. you know, wore out and, you know, compressed that cushion roller gets. Yeah. And, and if you look at, obviously, the extreme example, which is the one on the right, mm -hmm. um, this is one of those things where, you know, we got called into a job because the bowlers were complaining um, and, and literally – they were taking the paper and just turning it around and reusing it because it actually never touched the lane surface. Hmm. Um, that cushion roller was that small. So if you picture, you know, my hands about this big around, obviously uh, that cushion roller had some definite shrinkage mm -hmm. to it. All right. So the next thing that we're going to look at is your buffer brush adjustment. Um, and this is something that, you know, we like to check probably about once every quarter. Um, it's a very simple check. Mm -hmm. um, all we're going to do is put the buffer brush in the down position. Um, once again, we're going to have our, our straight edge across our LDS or secondary drive wheels. Um, and then we're going to go up to our, our primary. And we want about an eighth inch to three sixteenths of an inch of crush. Um, once again, they, they leave the factory at one eighth of an inch. Um, and we do that on purpose to prevent wear, things like that. Yeah, you're not. Um, but if you have some topography issues or, you know, I've seen it where sometimes I just talked to somebody a couple weeks ago and their lanes were so dished, the buffer brush in certain spots actually didn't hit the, mm. the middle of the lane, um, which is not a place you want that to happen. So you can always drop that down, obviously, if you need to. Um, but one eighth to three sixteenths is once again, you know, the adjustment on that. Um, and it, it applies the same for, for flexes all the way back to any of our original machines. And that's one of those, you know, the buffer brushes. I mean, most of the time, I mean, I can probably count on my hands, you know, as many years as I've been doing lanes and lane machines, how many times I've actually had to adjust a brush really to the lane. Most of the time, um, if you replace that brush when it needs to be replaced, you never actually have to adjust the machine. Exactly. The minute you put a new brush in, your crush and everything goes right back yep. into to tolerance of where it should be. So most of the time, if you're having to adjust that based upon initial install or topography, um, it'll tell you that that adjustment is where. You Correct. Know? So at that point, you can adjust it and hobble it along. But realistically replacing the brush and everything will go right back into tolerance. And and the other part is, you know, out of all the brushes that I've replaced on all the machines I've replaced them on, very rarely is that brush ever bad from 10 to 10. No, it's never. Well, we, <laughs> add, we put oil 10 to 10. Um, most of the time, yeah. I mean, when you're running house patterns compared to tournament patterns, sure. I mean, if you look at our tournament machines, I mean, we'll get, you know, three, four years sometimes, depending on you know, I mean, tournaments and that, sure. but in general, because we are conditioning across, you know, running four to seven, two to twos, we're not burning that brush out on the outside where house patterns one, maybe even no two to twos anymore yep. with the new rule. Yep. You're going to wear out that brush much, much quicker because of the f amount of friction you're creating. So exactly. keep that in mind too. Exactly. A little bit of outside oil on your brush isn't a bad thing. So the next thing that we're going to look at um, is obviously an adjustment also that's typically overlooked. And that's yeah, a, a lot of people don't look at this. Exactly. Um, and we look at it whenever you see us doing lanes, especially at an event, you'll always see us walking with the lane machine. Um, and typically we're looking inside the lane machine. And obviously, you know, on the touchscreen machines, we're looking at valve times, run times, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, but usually when we set a machine up, one of the first things we look at is the crush on the brush. Um, it's very, very easy to see. And as you'll see here, basically what we're looking for on the front side of the brush, if your brush was actually spinning, we want to see this gray line about one sixteenth of an inch thick. And that's going to tell us that the buffer brush is actually hitting the transfer brush 
and it's folding those bristles over into one another, mm -hmm. which is what gives us that line. Um, on the machines with the dual transfer brushes, such as you know the original uh, Ion Model Bs or Sport Model machines, if they haven't been upgraded, um, even the Custodians, Custodian Pluses, you know you can always pull the brush backwards with the machine in the transport position and, and check your gap here that you can see in the picture and on your this right. This is one that you know I tell people you know especially when you get a new machine or you replace some new parts, you know you get it adjusted. There's a break in, sure, you know. And certainly the longer it goes, you know, you might come out of adjustment. But this one is, if your brushes aren't adjusted properly, that conditioner is not going to get transferred to the lane. So you could all of a sudden be, you know, have loose contact and get more oil at the end of your pattern. Yep. Or you could bury it in there and now <laughs> you're going to wear out the two brushes way faster than they should because you're yep. you're burying those. As, so, as well as your but it's an important adjustment because you might make adjustments to your pattern again and but that conditioner is not getting transferred properly so this is one i tell people to look at really more so than probably maybe your buffer crush or sure, that at exactly. the end of the day exactly and and um obviously not having enough crush is something that's really easy to see because you're not yeah you see will, the line you, um but when you have too much crush you'll actually see waves in that transfer mm -hmm. brush and that's the easiest way to see that as well so you really shouldn't see that transfer brush flex too much um, but you should see that gray line. And along with that adjustment, um, another one, especially on our newer machines, yep, flexes, icons, duo systems. Um, the duo system, you know, um, or if you've done any upgrades, is your transfer roller adjustment. Um, I would say in this area of the machine, that is probably the number one overlooked adjustment. Um, which can definitely change how much oil you have down lane because this helps control how fast it peels yes. off the brush. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking for here um, is basically one eighth inch of crush from the brush to the roller itself. Um, and as we as we state, you should be able to hear that metal ting when that buffer brush is rolling. Kind of like if you have one of our older Phoenix S machines mm -hmm. with the double rollers, it, it always had that very distinct, mm -hmm. you know, metal ting when it was going against that buffer brush. Um, the adjustment for this is pretty easy, um, but sometimes uh, it, there's some things that can be overlooked with that as well. So there's um, two small screws that you're gonna obviously loosen up, which you'll see the two screws on the block um, right next to the transfer roller itself, and that block is actually slotted. So once you loosen up those two, um, there's the adjusting bolt that you'll see mm -hmm. um, on the front of that block, and if you turn that bolt out and then grab the actual roller and kind of pull it to you, that's gonna give you more crush. If we need less crush, then we're gonna use the bolt to turn it away. Um, but there's a lot of machines that, you know, I rebuild or, or looked at. And when I walk into the center, um, I know that they tried to put more crush on it, but they never pulled the roller to them. And you'll actually see that gap, yeah, that gap in between the adjustment screw mm -hmm. um, where they tighten everything up. Exactly. So they, they tried to make the adjustment, but it actually didn't happen. And your left to right is very important because you're Correct. independently, you know, kind of or can do right or left. So you might have way more crush right and then lose it across the left. So make sure that gap that you're looking at is even across that entire roller so that you're smoothly getting to the left and the right side of the lane. This is probably outside of cleaning, which is obviously one of the most important things you'll do. But uh, when we hear about carry down or, you know, the patterns change from the beginning of the season until now, this is the first place I go on a machine that has a duo you know, set up. Mm -hmm. um, the duo setup is, is a lot easier to clean, a lot easier to maintain. The adjustments are a lot easier to get to, but you just have to keep an eye on certain things. And once again, if you're honing in on the lane machine as it's running, you'll, you'll hear. hear those certain mm -hmm. things. You, you know, if you have too much crush on your transfer brush, you'll hear that motor strain a little bit. Um, if you don't have enough crush on your transfer roller, then obviously you won't hear that metal sound. So something else that's overlooked a lot of times um, and some things that we just don't think about is your head timing adjustment. So for those of you that have uh, spray jet machines, um, you're only going to do one side of this adjustment. For those of you that obviously have direct cleaning, you're going to do both ends of this adjustment. Um, but it's very important to walk your back ends when you're doing your lanes. Uh, we walk every back end at every event that we do. We're looking to make sure that, you know, obviously uh, the back ends are clean. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no streaks in the pattern, like something, you know, unfortunately got stuck in a squeegee blade or, or something like that. 
Um, but the other thing we can look at, especially on house patterns, most of the time they're symmetrical. Mm -hmm. So when you're walking the back ends and you look at your pattern and it looks like it's shifted to one side or the other, chances are you need to make this head timing mm -hmm. adjustment. Um, so basically what you're going to do for those of you that have, uh, you know, direct cleaning machines, we're going to make sure that our oil head and our cleaner head are directly lined up in the center of the machine with one another. Now, if you have to make that adjustment, you're going to be leaving the oil head in place and just loosening up the pulley on your cleaner head. It's slotted as well. It's got an acorn nut on the side of it. Um, you'll loosen that up, take the belt off, move the head get exactly that. where you want to get it without mm -hmm. moving the, the uh, oil head, mm -hmm. and then put everything back together. Um, obviously, uh, I guess I got a little bit ahead of myself, but just so that everybody is aware, for those that are new to the machine, um, these heads run simultaneously together on the same motor. That's why it's so important that, that they're timed out. And usually it's the cleaner head that, you know, comes off because sure. someone, you know, especially on the DC machines, they grab the head and, yep. you know, pull on it and it'll jump a cog here or there. Or sometimes, you know, they uh, leave a rag back there or something and the head binds up. Yep. Or, uh, they put the recovery tank in wrong and, 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 the, and get the, it stuck on the The line goes in between. Yep. So, um, you know, not that it happens often, but that's usually, you know, your cleaner head. And now you're leaving maybe a stripe of oil, you know, if you're oiling gutter to gutter, yeah, right. but maybe a stripe on edge board to edge board. So. And, and I've been famous for, um, well, you've been with me a couple of times. I've done it for filling the machine up or getting ready to run a test. And I leave the, the splash guard open for filling the chemicals up and all of a sudden the head gets jammed up and you tag on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you got to go back around and then sometimes you have to check, especially if your belts are a little loose or they have mm -hmm. some, some wear to them. Um, you know, those cogs aren't as, aren't as steep as they used to be. Um, that can cause your timing to jump a little bit. Mm -hmm. So once you have, you know, both those heads lined up, all you have to do is go around to the 10 pin side of the lane machine. Um, I'm going to give you the way we adjust this in the field. There's a really long drawn out process in the owner's manual, it's um, but this one's a lot simpler. Mm -hmm. um, you go to the 10 pin side of the machine and you'll see this board counting prox um, as well as this target that's in the picture to the right. And you want to make sure that with the heads in the center of the machine, one of the teeth on that target is directly top Head center of that prox. prox. Mm -hmm. Um, if that's not the case, then your head timing is not right. And all you have to do is loosen up the two set screws on the target. You can turn it until one of those teeth are on top of that prox, lock it down, and you're good to go. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there, there's a lot of centers that, that, once again, I've walked into, and, you know, they'll say that the, the left's really open and the right's kind of shut down, or the right's really open and the left is shut down, and we can walk back ends, and, well, there's your problem. Yep. So... Um, the tour that we just did uh, overseas. I mean, how many head adjustments did I make out of probably seven or eight machines? I probably Pretty adjusted, much. yeah, at three least quarters three. Of yeah. Them. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So very much an overlooked adjustment that can affect your pattern and what's on that program sheet. Um, something else that can obviously, you know, affect that is your lane machine speeds. Um, as we've talked about in a lot of our seminars Last previously. Last couple webinars. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, we've talked about how important taper is and, and you know, buffer brush speed and, and what that accounts to on the lane itself. But if your lane machine speeds aren't right, once again, what's on that piece of paper isn't what's going to go on the lane. Um, you know, if they're running too slow, you're going to get more oil up front and less down lane. Um, if they're running too fast, it could be the opposite. Mm -hmm. So it's very important, um, you know, to check your motor speeds. Obviously, I put up our touchscreen machines here, um, our sport model machines and our yes. flexes. Um, and the icons as well, they, they auto speed adjust themselves. Um, it's a very simple test to run. And, and a lot of people ask me, you know, how often do I need to run this test? Well, I always recommend walking your first couple lanes when you're running your lane machine. So if you see that your numbers are more than two apart, if your machine's supposed mm -hmm. to be running at 18 and it's running at 15 or 16, next time you pull it out, run an auto speed adjust. Um, and basically all you're going to do is put it next to the lane and go into your drive motor section. Um, go to auto speed adjust and start it. And if you have a walker, it's going to run that same lane mm -hmm. six times on its own auto adjust. Uh, if you have a handle model machine, then, you know, you have to physically run that lane six times um, and it'll adjust everything forward and reverse, yeah, reverse. which, uh, you know, obviously is very important as well. 
If you don't have one of these machines um, and you still have the ION Model Bs or below, um, you're actually going to have your speed control relay board, um, which will have seven trim pots across it, uh, one for each speed, the six speeds mm -hmm. on the machine, and then one for overall. And you'll actually do this adjustment on your approach in your output menu. Um, so you can set, you know, speeds one through six. Um, and then once you finish with that, you'll want to make sure to run a lane so that when the machine's under a load, those yeah, speeds still match what you had on your approach. Um, so when you're doing those, you know, for your 10 inches per second, as the machine's running on the approach, it should flash between 9 and 10, 9 and 10, thir or for 14, obviously 13, 14, and then right down the line. Normally when you put it on the lane, everything's yeah. going to be good after that. Pretty close, yes. Or, you know, I always tell people, too, if you got a big event coming in for the weekend or, you know, something like that, always a good time to, sure. you know, before you start the event to make sure, rather than find out in the middle of the event, <laughs> you set your speeds correctly, guess what? Your pattern's different. Exactly. So always better to catch it and make sure before you're in the middle. This is the second thing that we do when we do setups at events. First mm -hmm. thing is obviously always run a clean only, make sure everything's good. And then the next thing that we do is always, you know, a speed, speed adjustment. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing that we'll look at really quickly is your lane to lane adjustment. Um, doesn't so much affect your pattern, but if you spend all that money on a machine that walks and your bowlers walk in and, and it has to, you know, obviously steer and make a three point turn to get into your, you know, or to get into your lane, it into the lane. <laughs> um, you know, it, it just doesn't look as good for your investment. So I put the, the icon walker screen up here, but the theory behind everything is basically the same, whether you have, um, you know, a model B walker or a sport or um, a flex or, or an icon walker. Mm -hmm. um, so basically what we're looking at, and a lot of people don't actually know this number, but for the flex machines and all the newer software in the sport model machines, if you take your measurement from center dot to center dot um, and you divide that measurement by 0 0.31, that'll actually give you your number of counts. So, for instance, what we see here, um, you know, if it's, um, what do I have here, 36 inches between caps mm -hmm. um, from dot to dot, we divide that by 0 0.31 and we get 116 counts. So that's going to be our starting point. And this becomes great, especially if you have, uh, you know, uh, walkways, pillars, walkways, yep. things like mm -hmm. that. Um, you know, you can measure from Take point A to that. point B and, and you're going to be pretty darn close when you fire the machine up. Mm -hmm. However, all of this makes no difference if the machine's not walking straight. Yep. Balanced motors. Exactly. So when people call in for tech support, you know, the first thing we always ask them is, have you balanced your motors? Um, and for those of you that don't um, or aren't quite sure how to do that, there's a, a small box um, that is on the center of your center plate, uh, basically just to the left of center, actually. And it'll have two sets of wires in it. It's either going to have a red and a white or it'll have um, a yellow wire in place of one of those two colors. So when you do your walking test, um, which is fairly simple, you would square your machine up 90 degrees on the lane, um, just like it was walking down your center. Make sure that uh, you know the back of the machine is square with one of the boards on your approach. Hit the drive forward button so it walks forward a pair. Um, and you want to make sure that the back of the machine is still square. Mm -hmm. So if the right side of the machine is a little bit farther forward, then we know that our 10 pin drive motor is a little bit faster. We're going to add a resistance wire to that side of that box. Um, same or thing. Shorten that one. Yeah, exactly. So we always want to make sure the machine's walking straight first. It's like building the foundation of the house and then we can adjust our walking and our turns from there. Um, something else that you want to look at in your centers is obviously your transition blocks coming off the lane itself. So if you have one transition that's higher than the other, the wheel can catch and that machine doesn't have spatial awareness. It just knows that it comes off the lane straight, you know, turns 131 counts, which is 90 degrees and then drives forward its set number of counts and then turns again. Um, so if it comes off the lane crooked, that's going to affect everything else that has to do with your walking. Uh, so it's very important, um, you know, that you obviously look at those transitions. If you do have a lane that it just won't come off straight on, then you can go in and adjust your Adjust turns. it individually per lane. Exactly. Uh, but typically, you know, we like to just mess with, with step number seven, which is your straightforward mm -hmm. um, instead of adjusting turns for every lane. 
So just a couple key components on the lane machine. Obviously, um, on the left-hand side of the screen, we're going to be looking at our AC machines. So we have our, our drive motor board and the speed relay board that we spoke about earlier. That's the board that you would make your adjustments for your speeds on. And that's going to be pretty standard across all of our AC machines. Um, to the right side, that's going to be the, the drive and speed control boards for all of our DC machines. So just as we talked about the cushion rollers, um, on the far right-hand side of the screen would be our original dry motor boards um, that mm -hmm. had some trim pots on them that you could adjust, acceleration, deceleration, etc. And we have since moved to the board that is in the center of that right-hand pick. Um, as technology increases and, and cost comes down to consumer, obviously we incorporate that technology in our lane machines. So this board's, uh, I don't want to say better, but it's more technologically advanced mm -hmm. than the original board that we put in. Doesn't need the jumper. It, exactly, and, you know. exactly. Um, so if you do have to order a board for whatever reason, you're going to receive the board that is in the center of the picture. And then obviously to the left-hand side of that um, would be the speed control board for things like our water cleaner pumps in our machines. And then a quick look at electrical. Uh, for those of you that do have the, you know, Ion Sports, Flexes, uh, those type of machines, icons, um, something that's overlooked a lot of times is the top left picture, which is the analog plug. So basically what this controls is anything that is controlled in your touchscreen. So when you're adjusting, um, you know, your cleaner volume ratios through the touchscreen or your oil volume ratios through the mm -hmm. touchscreen, um, <clears throat> your drive motor speeds and the auto calibration, all of this is done through that plug. So a lot of times I'll get a phone call where, you know, certain components don't work or all three of those go down. And the first thing I tell the customer to do is obviously check that go plug. To, mm -hmm. Exactly. So just from setting the machine down hard or lifting it up or, you know, going over a brad transition to the back of your bowling center to store the machine, um, those plugs can come loose. The next thing that we want to look at, obviously, is, you know, the water speed control board, um, which you'll see the underside of the flex here. Um, once again, this runs through your analog controller. Everything is controlled in the touch screen itself. Um, and surprisingly enough, um, to the right of that is the PLC. This is basically the brains of the mm -hmm. machine. Um, and sometimes we take things for granted when we get phone calls and we tell somebody to check something on the Go PLC the, yeah. and, and they're, you know, they're not quite sure exactly what that is. So the PLC is the programmable logic controller, and that's basically what holds the programming for your lane machines and turns all your relays and, and on and off and, and seize your input signals. And then finally, um, on the bottom picture, we're gonna look at our stepper driver controls, which is on our Ion Sports, our Flexes, um, and this allows us to uh, basically <clears throat> change speeds on motors by using stepper motors in that, that area of the machine. So we typically use them on the oil pump and the oil head. Uh, Gives you that adjustable mic stream ability exactly. in those those particular machines exactly and they're they're much much more accurate um, so that's why we use them on the oil head and, and the oil pump um, once again this is part of keeping your machine clean as well um, I won't say exactly what the price of those are but um, they are don't pour fairly expensive in. yeah don't get liquid in there and make sure they stay clean um, mm -hmm. so we always want to make sure when you're changing your paper on your you know your cushion that uh, you know, make sure you put the cleaner head somewhere just in case you forget to put it back. Empty your recovery tank. Yeah, empty your recovery tank. Exactly. Um, and speaking along those lines, some electrical nose. Uh, this is one machine or panel that we got back. Um, and they were cleaning the machine and tried to do it with a flammable electrical contact cleaner or some type of cleaner mm -hmm. along those lines. So... Once that vacuum motor fired up, that chemical wasn't dry and uh, poof. Lit it on fire. <laughs> so now we'll talk a little bit, um, obviously, about machine maintenance and how important machine maintenance is, um, obviously, to making your pattern. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to maintenance, you know, I always tell people, you know, if you're spending more than 10 minutes a day, you're not cleaning your machine every day. I mean, in most cases, you should be able to wipe it down, empty it, fill it, in 10 minutes and you know not have to spend hours upon hours of cleaning your machine so the more you can do this every day or the more you should do it every day wipe it down in that that plus a loose bolt here or a loose yep. caster while you're wiping it down you're going to catch that you know before before things become 
you know, uh, a major, exactly. <laughs> major type issue, you know, and that's important. So, yeah, no question. I mean, as Gus said, you know, five or 10 minutes a day, um, you know, maybe 20 minutes once a week, you know, on Friday or whatever day it may be that you pick a um, couple hours once a month and then, you know, doing your maybe a half a day once every six months and that machine will be immaculate. You'll know what's going to happen before it happens and you can prevent it before it happens. And that's the key, prevent it, you know, because, you know, if you're doing your dailies, you know, your monthly and annually that we'll talk about become pretty simple. It doesn't yep. become a, a whole day project. Exactly. And I tell people, you know, looking at the daily maintenance that we have here, um, I typically carry three rags. Um, and the first thing we're obviously going to do is wipe the machine down thoroughly. Um, I try to never cross contaminate anything. The outside of the machine is one rag. The cleaning compartment's one rag and the oiling compartment's one rag. Uh, and when people ask me, what do you wipe down? Uh, not to be smart, but if it's, you know, dirty or looks like it can get dirty, wipe it down. Um, and, and that should take you between all of this five to 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, you always want to make sure, obviously, in your daily maintenance, you wipe your recovery tank or I'm sorry, empty your recovery mm -hmm. tank. And you want to do this before you stand the machine up. Um, I have seen very full tanks go up ramps and then it back feeds mm -hmm. into the vacuum motor, which then can get on a lot of really expensive electrical mm -hmm. components. Um, something that is overlooked when you empty the recovery tank, when you pull the elbows off, wipe the inside of the elbows out. Because when you put those elbows back on the tank and then you stand the machine up, if you haven't wiped those elbows out, there may be some residual in mm -hmm. there. And over the course of the next 12 hours, the machine sits that can leak on some key electrical components as well. Um, but something else, obviously, is to wipe down the squeegee blades every time that we get done with the lane machine to make sure they're clean. I've seen a lot of lanes where we've seen lines going down the lane and it's not because of a squeegee adjustment. It's just because there's so much dirt on the dirt blades inside that, the ridge, yeah, yeah. that it can't pick anything up. Um, cleaning the transfer brush, um, you know, compressed air is a very good tool to use. Um, I don't necessarily like to use compressed air on that every single day. I prefer to wipe it out with a clean rag and then fire my buffer brush up to kind of throw any dirt that I have mm -hmm. um, outside the back of the machine. And then obviously wiping down the brush itself with a clean, dry rag yeah. um, to get any of that residual off of there. And then, uh, you know, finishing up with your old drip pads. And then you can put it on charge or, or wrap up your cord and put it away for the night. Mm -hmm. um, on the monthly side of things, this is where obviously, you know, we'll blow the machine out with compressed air. Um, I like to take the side guards off and kind of blow everything out there and look at those components that we don't have access to see. Um, you know, we can check our head timing at that point in time, um, check connections on motors, things like that. Um, and then obviously with those guards off, it becomes very easy to check your buffer and squeegee adjustments. Um, you can check your cleaner filter from the top of the machine um, and something obviously along those lines as well, how you store your cleaner funnel becomes very important as well. Um, if you, you know, store your funnel with it sticking straight up and, and there's a big open, open air jug. in mm -hmm. or, or an open jug, you're going to get dirt accumulated in it. And it may just be a little bit that you don't see now, but, you know, if you're running your machine twice a day after 730 runs you might. in a year, mm -hmm. that filter is going to be pretty dirty because there's going to be a lot of stuff in that tank. Um, you also obviously want to look in the bottom of your tank, check your oil filter, uh, make sure that there's no crud in there. Um, and then obviously you can fix accordingly. Um, transfer brush adjustments, cleaning around the PLC, checking that analog controller, um, checking that analog plug to make sure everything's tight. Um, obviously, electricity and lane oil don't typically get along very well together. Um, so being able to clean around that PLC becomes important as well. Um, I like to remove and clean the vacuum motor. You don't necessarily have to remove the motor. But, you know, if you're doing all your other stuff, you want to make sure that vacuum yeah. motor is clean. There's no soot around it or things like that. Um, the cool thing that we have, um, if you go to our YouTube page and you do need to take that vacuum motor apart or change brushes or really clean it out deeply, um, you know, you can go to our YouTube page and, and see how to do that. Mm -hmm. We have some really cool videos on making adjustments and taking things apart. Um, and then obviously, you know, lastly, and during the month, not only are we checking that cushion roller or that cloth for those lines, you want to check the cushion roller itself. Make sure there's no rips, tears, you know, a, a dowel didn't come up yep. and rip tear. a squeegee blade mm -hmm. or tear the cushion roller or, you know, a bumper as well. 
And then on the annual side of the maintenance, obviously, um, as we said, based off a 32 lane center, um, usually once a year, this is when I like to change the transfer brush. Um, obviously we have check it here for excessive wear, um, but I'm a big proponent of, you know, changing all those parts on the lane machine two, three, four weeks before the, you know, the winter season starts up. So it starts out fresh and the bowlers know what they're, they're gonna be expecting. Um, once again, changing the squeegee blades, um, you know, pull and cleaning your spray jets or, or changing your cleaner tip, um, checking your drive wheels, lane to lane casters for excessive wear, which if you do see excessive wear, you wanna look at your transitions in your bowling center, um, whether it's, you know, from lane to lane or whether it's how you're getting the machine to the, the back mm -hmm. of the bowling center. Um, obviously, we're going to change our cushion roller during our annual maintenance and our vacuum and drive motor brushes. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things when you're looking at, you know, the three components that really uh, make the machine do what it does and make sure is, you know, buffer brush, transfer, squeegees, and cushion. <clears throat> By doing those all at once, you pretty much know everything's going to, you know, stay within its parameters the whole season or, exactly. you know, you'd like to. but. I always tell people, well, okay, I put in a an expensive buffer brush, but I didn't change my squeegees, <laughs> right. and now all the squeegees are letting liquid, and now that liquid and cleaner is getting all over the, the buffer brush into the transfer brush. You wind up tearing apart your brush or contaminating the bristles, yep. and now you got to replace those plus that. So typically, if you do those three components, you're not going to worry about having contamination or something go wrong at the wrong part of time. And now you got to spend, you know, additional money, money. to replace an item at this, you know, again. Exactly. So, so, and like Gus said earlier, you know, as much as we like selling parts, we want to sell them because you actually need them. Um, you know, not because they wore out prematurely because neglect. You know, or, or, yep. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, so speaking of cleaning itself, um, one thing that we want to look at and one thing that our founder is known for, um, you know, it, it's a statement that we say at every seminar, you, you can't pe paint the Mona Lisa on a dirty canvas. OK, so with the lane being your canvas, um, obviously, in your program sheet being what you want to paint, we want to make sure that that lane is clean. If you look at the lane on the left, um, oil is not going to bond to that surface. Um, and a lot of times we'll walk in the centers and, and we'll see that. And I always get the, you know, the famous. Well, if it doesn't quite clean the middle of the lane, it's okay. It's more hold. Uh, but that was 30 years ago. Exactly. And, and at the end of the day, it's not really because oil can't bond to that surface. So it's actually going to end up breaking down faster a lot of times. And that picture that you see on the left, that was actually, uh, we went in and created holes or gaps in the cushion roller. Right. And that's what created that because uh, you can see where cleaner was and where, yep. it was, you know, so... Um, at the end of the day, I mean, a lot of times too, you know, we'll say 80% of a lot of the calls we get for patterns or this or that. First thing we do is, have you done a test clean? Yep. Have you done this? Have you, you know, check that because um, the pattern's not going to bond. It's going to break down. It's going to create dirt. And you might be changing all your program sheet or conditioner and at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you're not getting the lane clean. Exactly. So. And, and the worst thing is when you do go and you rebuild the lane machine, if it was like this previously, now you're starting from scratch with your pattern. Just like you said, you know, you, you've changed everything to accommodate this and um, it's not going to be a good couple of weeks for your bowlers. So the lane, obviously, that we see on the right, um, perfectly clean. So as we apply oil to that lane, you know, it's going to be exactly as we have it on the program sheet, as long as everything's adjusted. And a lot of times, you know, people ask how often do I do a test clean or, you know, I mean, in, in the perfect world, maybe every day, okay, right. just to make sure. But in reality, a lot of times, you know, depending on your, your maintenance program or whatever, you know, if you're coming back from the weekend, you know, typically Monday is a good day mm -hmm. um, because you got weekend, maybe part-time help maybe not paying attention to your lane machine, anything can happen on, exactly. on the weekend. So, you know, um, if you're starting your leagues for that week, it's not a bad time to check that once a week. But a lot of times we'll ask, you know, how often do you do it? And we'll see no hands <laughs> in the yeah. air. So, um, you know, again, it's like anything. You do it, you check it. It's better to know than hope. Yep. And if you know it's clean, then you can eliminate and then go forward with finding out what maybe your other issues are. Exactly. Um, so 
when we talk about cleaning, obviously we talked about our annual, um, if you do have a spray jet machine, so we definitely want to replace check valves, tip retainers um, every year. This will help prevent um, dripping, obviously, Drips. and it'll make sure that you're getting the proper amount of volume out on the lane itself. So um, throughout the seminar, obviously, we're going to post this back on YouTube, but we have some part numbers here for the tip retainer, screen check valves, um, and obviously your inside or outside spray tips. And a lot of these are, you know, unfortunately, they're inherent drips, yep. you know, but a lot of time, you know, we'll change the check valve or, you know, adjust that little spring with the ball that gets stuck in there. But people won't re replace the retainer because exactly. they're like, oh, I just need a new check valve. And actually, if that retainer is not seated in there, there, that's where you're getting a lot of that yep. liquid through there. So um, really, you need to look at replacing both of those, maybe not every time, but certainly you know, through the course, if sure. you are experiencing a lot of drift. And, and that retainer, you know, once again, we're talking in the grand scheme of things, yeah. you know, very inexpensive parts. Um, when you're setting your spray jets, obviously, to make sure that everything's clean, um, we're looking at the seven pin side, you know, 10 and four on the clock for your inside jet, 12 and six, mm -hmm. um, you know, for your outside jets. Um, and then for your 10 pin side of your machine, obviously two and eight and 12 and six again, um, basically making sure that the entire lane is covered with cleaner um, and then you can adjust you know your pitch on them basically up or down to get it to spray farther wider etc mm -hmm. um, so you get you know some more emulsification as you're cleaning the goal is to get them adjusted to cover the lane without spraying the gutters. gutters and capping exactly um, if you have one of our newer machines from the custodian plus and forward obviously we're looking at the direct cleaning um, which is patented by us, um, and it's what makes our machines you know, separate from every other one out in the field, basically. So with a direct cleaning, it's like the two cleaning heads that we saw earlier when we were making the head adjustments. Um, we have one head motor that controls both the oil and the cleaner head. Mm -hmm. They go opposite of one another as it's going down the lane, and it's applying cleaner directly to the lane surface from edge to edge out of a tip, almost like your oil head works. Um, so basically what we're looking at, because we have the patent on the method as well, is cleaner cloth and then squeegee, mm -hmm. which is why, um, you know, when adjusted properly, our machines clean so well. And something that we want to look at here is obviously the way that works. So when we're looking at our peristaltic pumps, this is what actually pumps the cleaner out to those heads. Um, if you look at the pump on the left, um, if you were to order a pump now, this is the color and the style that it will mm -hmm. come in. Um, originally, when you probably got your machine, it was clear. So once again, we've made some changes, a little bit better materials. Um, and as that comes down in cost to us, we obviously pass that, that on to the customer. Um, so what we want to look at is the picture on the right um, is how this pump actually works. So you have five rollers, basically, that roll around mm -hmm. a tube that's inside that clear bell housing. And that's what pushes cleaner out of the head. So when you're looking at that cleaner come out of the head, never comes out in a stream, it always looks like it's, it's pulsing. pulsing. Exactly. Um, so this is how that pump works. And obviously you can see on the bottom, um, one of the pumps that we have, uh, you know, out of our Model B machines. And typically, I mean, the good part about these compared to like the spray machines where you're putting cleaner through the actual pump and everything in there, you know, this at the end of the day, the motors, everything, you know, you're not putting too much stress on them. Really, it's about replacing that tubing. Exactly. And and the, the biggest key factor is with this style pump and how we use it. Now we can measure cleaner output volume, just like we measure, obviously, oil output volume. So the tubing that we were talking about, this is the Norprene tubing that would go in this pump. Um, and you want to replace this yearly. So um, as this tubing sits in the pump and that roller continuously goes around and around, the walls on that tubing end up getting weak. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing your volume tests, you know, once a week on that Monday when you're doing your test cleans, um, you'll start to see probably after eight or 10 months, that volume will start to go down, down, down um, to the point where, you know, you'll want to change that tubing. And we that's a good one, you know, because, you know, um, not only obviously sanction technology to make sure we can fluid meter out the oil, make sure that's right every day, but it's the only system that you can actually, you know, do your volume checks to make sure that the same amount of cleaner today is going out on the lane. So exactly. again, if it's right and you're not cleaning, it's a quick elimination process, you know, to, to know, hey, I'm putting out the same today. 
you know, or if that is a case, you can, you know, replace the tube. Exactly. And there's, you know, you can always raise the values a little bit on your mm -hmm. touch screen to, you know, to increase your volume. But once again, once you get to a certain level, because we're looking at between 28 and 28 and 32 mils is what we want to pump out when we run our volume test. Um, you know, once you get to a certain value number on, on your touchscreen, it's time to go ahead and change that tubing. But we like to do it once a year, and then typically you don't have to worry about it. Correct. Um, another thing that's very important that, that's overlooked a lot of times is the cleaner tip adjustment. Um, so two things with this. One, we always want to lube our head bars. Um, that's something that I see that's overlooked a lot of times. So every time we change our cushion roller, or I'm sorry, every time we change our claw, um, put a little bit of oil on your head bar. Um, that way you don't have any play in your heads. Mm -hmm. And the next thing we want to look at, obviously, is the tip height. Um, so we want that as close to the lane surface as we can get without obviously being underneath the lip of the machine. Um, this is going to prevent it from spraying on the inside of the ledge. Um, I've seen a lot of times where it's been adjusted a little bit too high and they haven't been lubing the head bars like they should. Mm -hmm. And the head bars will start to move or the, the head will move back and forth and ends up spraying the lip. When it sprays a lip, it ends up dripping on the lane or, or on the approach itself. So very simple adjustment um, to actually to do this. Um, there's a collar on your cleaner head, and you're just going to loosen up the, the uh, screw on that collar. You can adjust the collar up and down to set your tip height. Um, another thing that we want to look at in this picture is the one on the left. You'll see that we have a purple tip mm -hmm. on this cleaner head. Um, and on the right, you'll see our new white tip. Um, so this tip came out in 2013 when we came out with the flex right. machines. Mm -hmm. And if you do not run this tip, um, it's highly recommended that, that you run it now. Um, whereas, you know, you'll go through a bag of five on the purple type tip with the white tip. A lot of people are going through their yearly maintenance um, and then just replacing the tip because it's a yearly maintenance thing. Mm -hmm. Not actually because it's gone yeah. bad. Uh, we've got, you know, quite a few machines that probably are still running the original yes. tips. Yep. So. Exactly. It's, um, yeah, I, I know one center actually that has had that tip in for probably three or four years now and doesn't drip, still puts out the same amount of volume. Yeah, as so. long as you don't catch it on something yeah, or exactly. it's adjusted properly, yep. you know. Exactly. Um, so real quick, just to recap some expert tips for best cleaning. Um, you know, obviously we want to look at that cushion roller. Uh, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, it's not warped and we're looking at the, the cloth and the lines on the cloth as we get done with our lanes or as we change our paper. Um, obviously, you want to check your cleaner volumes. Once again, Monday is usually a really good time to do it if you have the ability to do it because your legs are coming in for that week. You know, you just got through the weekend and you may not be sure what exactly happened mm -hmm. over the weekend. Um, so check your cleaner volumes once a week. Um, your machine speeds. You know, obviously we want to look at them as we're running the lane machine. Just walk down the first lane and make sure that your speeds uh, match within a number. Um, and also be aware how that affects cleaning. So um, something that we really didn't touch on, but we can really quick. Obviously, the faster you run the machine, the harder it is for the machine to clean up what's on the lane. So that's why we typically don't run the machine in the heads faster than 18 inches per second. Um, and then speed it up as we go down the lane where there's actually less oil. And one of the things that a lot of people, you know, forget about or that we utilize a lot is that back end strip speed. Correct. You know, so optimum, typically most tournaments and a lot of the stuff will set that back end strip speed at 25, 26 and know that the back ends are getting, you know, clean compared to normally once you're out of your pattern, that machine will kick up mm -hmm. to 30 IPS. And in most cases, house patterns and that, you should be able to get off. But if you're running multiple patterns where one pattern is maybe 39 and you're going to a 44 and that speed kicks sure. up, you might not be getting that longer pattern off when you go shorter. So by being able to utilize that back end strip speed, you know, it really will help maximize. And if maybe you miss a day, you know you're still going to get the back end clean and not leave residue down there that will cause, you know, um, issues in the back end. Sure, sure, no question. Um, and, and something to tie along, obviously, with the cushion roller is make sure you use the correct cleaning cloth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of different brands out there and a lot of different ways they say it's the same. It's only cheaper, but you know, our cloth is typically um, thicker than than most others, um, and it, it has a larger footprint on the lane itself. So, 
uh, you know, your cleaning may come down to, to actually check in and what type of cloth you're using. Uh, another thing to look at is your dilution ratios. For those of you that are still mixing cleaner, uh, you know, on some of the, obviously on the flex machine, if you have the upgrades, you know, we have a water tank and a cleaner tank and, and it mixes on mm -hmm. its own. But regardless, you have to pick the proper dilution ratio for your center. So if you're running certain chemicals, you know, like a defense S or um, something along those lines, if you look at our cleaning chart, it's a little bit harder mm -hmm. to get up. So you may have to run it four to one or five to one. Um, if you're running a product such as, you know, Prodigy or um, even Fire Ice, things like that, it's a little bit easier to clean up. You may be able to get away with a six or a seven to one. All of our machines leave the factory at five to one. Mm -hmm. Um, and typically that'll clean the lane and then we can adjust or fine tune back end ball motion by adjusting our ratio. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm old school. I grew up, you know, um, mixing cleaner as strong as you possibly could. Cause I knew more than of course my MOS <laughs> or anyone else that told me how to mix cleaner. But at the end of the day, you know, I always tend to mix my cleaner a little stronger because I know <laughs> If I do have a hiccup or yep. all of a sudden, you know, you had 30 lines of house balls going down the lane, that stronger dilution is always going to get the lane clean where maybe you're on the borderline of getting the lane clean and then having a hiccup and not getting the lane clean. And now your pairs for league Different. or something aren't <laughs> quite the same. Sure. So I typically tend to miss, you know, towards that five to one, you know, four to one on the extreme if, you know, um, you know, and one thing we talk about, you know, obviously with the sprayless system, your speeds matter in that, you know, the gap or right. that zigzag, if you will, between them. So knowing I'm going stronger, I can change patterns or know my speed changes aren't going to overall affect me where a weaker ratio, all of a sudden a little faster or, you know, with there and you're not getting out as much volume. Sure. You might not get the lanes clean. So, um, but at the end of the day, the goal is, Make sure your lane's clean, whatever ratio that is. And if you're mixing it still by hand, do the same thing every day. You know, if you're going to mix five to one, mix it at five to one. If it's seven to one, you know, uh, again, because if you do have some inconsistencies in back ball motion or even getting, again, that borderline getting the lane clean every day, um, if multiple people aren't mixing it the same, your conditions are going to change. So you might exactly. start looking at all these other, you know, areas of lane conditioner, of, of even maybe the machine adjustments, and come to find out you might have three different people mixing your cleaner three different ways. Yeah, there's a little bit left in the jug. I'll just eyeball yeah, it. Yeah, it's okay. It's, yeah. So, you know, that is an area that I don't think a lot of times people look at or they really pay enough attention to is – is everyone doing the same thing? That's why if you are lucky and you do have a flex and you have the cleaning mixing, you pretty much know that it's being done the same way exactly. every day. And if you are running different patterns where you might not need the same ratio, now you can independently, you know, program your pattern to match that exact, you know, cleaner ratio. So it gives the people that have a flexes a little more, you know, um, areas to play with that, that cleaner ratio. Exactly. Um, obviously, we talked about replacing your Norpring tubing, you know, once every year. Um, that's a good good baseline to go by. And then maintaining the pool in front of your cushion roller, that's basically talking about your warping once again. So we mm -hmm. want to make sure that that cushion roller is nice and big and it maintains that pool of cleaner in front of it to clean your lanes. Um, and finally, visual confirmation. You know, yep. Do your test clean once, once a week, um, whether it's on Monday or Friday or whatever day it may be. Make sure that we're clean from edge to edge. Um, quickly, we're going to go over some things with uh, the conditioning side of the machine. Um, obviously, what we see here on the left-hand side of the screen is one of our FMI pumps. Um, I'm going to be very simple with this. Don't take this pump apart unless you've called us, and we definitely know that there's a problem with it. Mm -hmm. um, I can probably count on one hand how many times that pump has gone bad out in the field without somebody putting cleaner in an oil tank mm -hmm. or, or trying to take the pump apart when they yeah. shouldn't have. Cleaner in the oil does not go no, well. it doesn't work very well at all. Um, but basically the way this pump works, um, you know, it's an FMI pump. It's the same pump they use in hospitals. Um, so it's very accurate. It loses, I believe the number is about one tenth of 1% every mm -hmm. 1 million cycles. So if you call the office and you tell me that your oil volume is wrong when you do your oil volume test, 
I'm going to tell you to look just about everywhere else in the machine before this even crosses my mind. Um, and that little piston that you see there that controls this FMI pump, um, it's very fragile. I've broken one just from dropping it off the bench. Another reason not to take it apart. Uh, once again, this is probably one of the most expensive components mm -hmm. on the machine outside of the PLC. So uh, if you happen to have a flex machine, you're going to have two pumps <laughs> and uh, one pump motor and obviously two oil control mm -hmm. valves. So on the flex machine, just an FYI, if you are adjusting your pumps to make a match, um, when you're adjusting it in a touchscreen, because there's one motor, that's going to adjust both pumps together. Mm -hmm. So when we're initially setting up the machine, if one of them is a little bit higher than the other, we have to manually adjust the pumps. And then once we manually set them equal to one another, everything after that should fall and, into and play. And typically, I mean, these things don't come out of adjustment. No, I mean, we'll kind of ask the same thing. How many times, you know, does someone check their volume, right. you know, and they'll be like, I've never checked it. And it'll be exactly, <laughs> exactly the way it was. Most of the time, if there's an issue, people are in there, yep. you know, manually doing something maybe they shouldn't be doing or something like that. But, you know, exactly. Usually they don't miss a beat. No, not at all. That's like I say, one of the last things I go to when there's a problem with oil output. Um, so another thing that we want to look at is obviously your oil control valve. Um, now, these can tend to get a little bit dirty, especially if you're not cleaning your funnels before you put your oil in or you're not maintaining your, you know, your oil tank filters mm -hmm. or checking them regularly. Um, so if when your oil head's moving back and forth and it's actually pumping oil out on your brush, if you see your pressure gauge really start to fluctuate up and down, the chances are that you have a small clog in your oil control valve. Um, basically, the way this works is it's a through valve. So as the pump's running, it's always circulating back in the tank. And then in the center of that picture, you'll see a little plunger. And when that plunger activates, that oil now travels through a different Ooh. hole. That'll go to your oil head. And then that's what allows it to go board by board. So if we call for a, you know, a seven to seven, it turns on at seven board right, it turns off at seven board left. Um, so if you get a little bit of something inside that valve and it gets stuck behind that plunger, it doesn't allow that oil to fully go through that hole like it's supposed to. Um, really simple to take apart. We have a, a video on YouTube mm -hmm. um, that makes it very easy. The biggest thing with taking these apart um, is A, be very careful when you use tools because obviously the wires for that yes. plunge solenoid um, are very fragile. They're very thin. Um, and when you put it back together, you want to put it back together hand tight. The other yeah, thing don't, that, yeah, you don't, don't need to, no, don't wrench it <laughs> um, because there's, you'll see two shims in this one. Mm -hmm. Every valve is actually shimmed differently. Um, and they're shimmed where they're built. So A, you don't want to lose the shims and B, you don't want to over tighten them because then you're going to crush them and you're going to have the same problem and you're going to end up buying something buying that's one. fairly expensive. Mm -hmm. um, one more thing to look at, you'll see a sticker that's on the top of that valve. That sticker should always be facing you. Um, so if you put the valve in upside down, uh, what's going to end up happening if you're not paying attention is your pressure gauge is going to peg out. Um, your pulse suppression tubing is going to blow up and then it's literally going to explode and you're going to have oil everywhere. Yes, it's a mess. So if that sticker is missing, if you have an older lane machine where it's worn off or something mm -hmm. like that, take a Sharpie, mark it. That way you know where it's at before you take it apart. And then the last thing that we're going to look at um, is obviously doing your PSI settings, um, which is your pressure regulator tubing. Mm -hmm. Um, this becomes very important when you're changing chemicals, um, when you're going from different viscosities, you know, pressure and output volume are not dependent on one another. So I can put out, you know, a 50 UL stream at, at 20 microliters in my test tube with 20 pounds of pressure, 30 pounds, 40 pounds, or 50 pounds. But as I have higher viscosity conditioners, that can make that pressure gauge, you know, go up and peg. So typically on our sport model machines um, or our machines with our variable mics, you know, we like to see that pressure at, at 50 UL stream, somewhere around 35 pounds or so. Um, if you happen to put a conditioner in, let's say like terrain that's a very high viscosity, um, you may see that pressure go up. So in order to change that, all you're gonna do is cut that pressure regulator tubing, take a couple inches off at a time, you'll see your pressure drop down. Mm -hmm. Shorter the tube, lower the pressure. Um, for those of you that don't have uh, variable mic pumps in your lane machines, you know, whether it's an Icon or a Custodian Plus, Ion B, or, or any of our other sanctioned technology machines, um, you're going to want to be right around that 20-pound range, typically. 
in temperature, you know, if you're sure. up north where it's cold, you know, you don't want to be too, you know, exactly. on the border. I mean, at the end of the day, you don't want it at, you know, <laughs> zero right. and you don't want it pegging the gauge, you know. So there is some play and some people, I know back in the day, we would really, oh, if it's not at this, you know, pressure, you really, but there is tolerance in there depending on the PSI gauge you have and yep. depending on the machine you have. So if it goes up a little or drops a little, it's not panic time because, as you said, that has no correlation to the to the output. output. So. Exactly. And and the reason that we run a little higher on those you know those variable mic machines is so that we have that range. We have that range between so, that 30 to 60. 60 UL, you know, exactly. So, um, so we want to have enough pressure to get it into the brush if we're running it at lower stream volumes. So just a quick summary, um, obviously from our previous seminars and, and webinars, things like that, um, understanding the theory of, of how the machine operates is crucial in deciding whether a pattern adjustment or a machine adjustment is the proper course of action. Um, your daily, your monthly, yearly maintenance, crucial for pattern consistency. As I said in the beginning, those centers that haven't changed their patterns for two or three years um, and, you know, their bowlers walk in and they always know where to stand and where mm -hmm. to play and their scores are higher for that reason. Um, typically, they're following all the protocols that we just laid out. Um, you know, patterns, chemicals, the ability of the lane machine today are far different from what they were even two decades ago. So ratios, volume, um, theory of where and how to put it. It's all entering a new phase, and in order to put it where we need it, we got to make sure the lane machine is is up to par and doing everything it's supposed to do. So, hopefully, you guys can all stay tuned for uh, more to come. And something else that you'll see, just so you're aware, um, we're going to be doing a lot more with um, QR codes. So you'll see on our instructions as they start to come out um, on some of our flyers and things like that. You may see a code that looks like this. Um, if you scan that code, it may take you to a specific part of the website for mm -hmm. a, a video or a work instruction, um, how to's um, at events, you'll start to see them for lane patterns, things like that, um, or lane maps, depending on if they're posting them. Um, so if anybody needs our contact information, obviously Gus on the left, uh, me on the right, feel free to scan that code and it'll take you right to our V cards and then you can save it in your phone and, and email us or call us later. If, if you have any questions or concerns with your machine. Yeah, I mean, these are really cool. You know, um, we're always looking at ways to, to be more efficient and get the information to everyone, you know, as easy as possible. And uh, this is really cool and exciting that, you know, you're going to be able to do this and get a lot of the information, you know, much quicker or easier to find than sure. trying to navigate, you know, all over the place. So um, thanks again, Doug. I mean, awesome job as always. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Hopefully you got the, the information that you expected and you can take that back. And if nothing else, you know, you know, you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing at yep. the end of the day, or maybe some areas you're like, maybe I can do a better job. And now I have the information of, you know, how to do that. So um, we appreciate everyone's time as always for those that, uh, hang around or have questions for us, we're certainly going to go through and answer those. But if you got to go, certainly understandable. Definitely. Um, so again, thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you on the next webinar coming soon. So uh, let's see, Diego, um, how do you think a bowling center's HVAC system affects consistency? Um, this is kind of a loaded question because from the oiling standpoint, um, and we have some pretty interesting white page articles on this if you go to our website, but lane oil doesn't evaporate. So, um, you know, when you hear about things like that, you know, the lanes in front of the, the door or whatever it may be, um, you know, the oil evaporates and they're always drier. That may not always be the case. Um, it can change some things in topography, um, how the lane panels accept moisture, things like that, um, which we could get into for hours. So that's mm -hmm. definitely going to be another webinar that yep. we're going to do. Um, but as far as how it affects the oil itself, um, it doesn't make it disappear. Now, a couple things that can happen, and it's also in this white page article as well, um, is what your heating or cooling system actually puts on the lane itself. So uh, no matter how clean your bowling center is, 
Um, I've never been to a bowling center and cleaned a lane and not had a line on my cushion roller. Mm -hmm. So if you're oiling lanes, let's say the night before for your morning lane, all that dust, and especially if it's really cold and your and your your heating HVAC system's running, it's putting dust and dirt on the lane where it might not be a lot. It's enough to affect ball it's motion. Still going to create some friction, friction and exactly, um, and how the lane breaks down. So you know uh, something that I look at more when I'm when I was coaching or at an event or things like that. Um, what lanes are in front of the front counter because they're typically getting out first. Yep. Um, usually well, where exactly your, your odd lanes, because most of the time you don't like to put your bowling next to each other. So usually one, three, five, seven going down the line. Um, well, you we're know. all right handed. We don't, <laughs> we don't want to get that close to the ball return. Exactly. Um, so that's usually going to affect more than, than what your HVAC system is. As long as you know, you're not oiling lanes the night before for a tournament or things yeah. like that. I mean, there could be, you know, I mean, certain oils we try to, you know, uh, regulate, you know, how the, how they'll change under, you know, different temperatures and what centipoids will change and how that affects. But I mean, there could be extremes. If you're really super cold, obviously the machine's going to put out the same volume, you know, every right. time, but how cold that lane bed is, is going to change the footprint typically. Um, as you said, topography, you know, how that affects. So the extreme of temperatures, you know, will have some effect, but most of the time your HVACs are, are usually pretty consistent of what we try to keep. Right. Humidity can be one, whether, you know, what type of cooling and or the summer or, you know, where the door is and how many times it opens for humidity in Florida and some of that. But a lot of times that we see really affecting more of the approaches and how they slide per se than the actual, you know, conditioner itself. So, exactly. Good question. Uh, Merv, our friends over in Singapore. How important is the adjustment for buffer speed and what does it do to the lane pattern? Um, well, this is something that's obviously, you know, on the, the flex machines or, uh, you know, our sanctioned standards when we had them. Um, it, it's, it's important. That's why we put it in the machine. So obviously the faster we run that buffer, the more it's going to peel off the brush. So basically the taller the pattern is going to get. Um, and you want to make sure that, you know, that's consistent across the board. So on the flex, you know, you're looking at 700 RPM, 500, 200, and, and 100. And all those speeds can affect the pattern. So you want to make sure that you know, your 200 hasn't slowed down to a 100 if you're using slow buff at the end of your mm -hmm. pattern because you're not going to get the peel off and the pattern's not going to, once again, what's on that sheet's not going to be on that lane. Um, and, and that's a really good question. That's something, um, you know, obviously when you check your motor speeds, you know, that's something that you'll want to do you know, once a month, once every couple months um, to make sure that that buffer is spinning at the proper RPM because it can affect your pattern. Jim, all right. I must have missed this question while we were actually in the webinar. Um, is this adjustment the same on a flex machine? I'm not sure what adjustment that was, um, but if we fire back in or if you're still watching, um, hopefully I answered that question uh, when I was talking about the adjustments between the flex and other machines. Um, if not, just fire back in a question and, and we'll go ahead and take care of that for you. Let's see. Jeremy, uh, what if we still have a transfer roller? Um, what is the adjustment for that? Um, there is an adjustment for the transfer roller. I'm going to be completely honest with you. Typically, we don't really have to do a lot with that if we're changing the buffer brush on the regular. Um, but there is an adjustment um, on those machines where we can make that transfer roller go obviously closer or farther away mm -hmm. from the buffer brush. Um, if you want to shoot me an email with what machine you have, um, I can actually respond to that email and give you the exact adjustment based on which machine yeah, um, I mean, you have. Yeah, because it'll vary between the original Phoenix S yes, to yep. the wiper to the exactly. dual roll, you know. So, uh, yeah, if you, you know, certainly let us know which machine. But, yeah, I mean, uh, no different than the flex on that bottom one, you know, that crush will affect the pattern peel off. Um, how much is a tune up kit for a red DBA Phoenix S? Um, once again, if you want to email me for that, um, you know, we can definitely get you in touch with our distributor. Um, obviously, as we don't sell anything direct, that would be done through your distribution network. 
Um, but I'd be more than happy to uh, look at who your distributor is based on your area or who you order with. Get you the right part yep, number. Yep, we'll get you the right part number, mm -hmm. and uh, they can definitely get you a price for that. Let's see here. Don, do you ever notice when you run heavier volume pattern, patterns that there's more of a collection of oil to the rear or bottom of the machine, um, causing some drips? Um, that can definitely happen. Um, you know, and, and once again, that's another thing to look at for your adjustments. Um, if on your transfer brush, things like that, if it's picking it up too heavy, um, you know, that can cause that brush to get oversaturated and fling a lot of oil. It's another thing uh, we see a lot of times, and, and I know Don personally, I know he wipes all his machines down. But, um, you know, for those that don't necessarily wipe everything down or really clean your bottom plate when you stand the machine up, um, that oil will accumulate, or if, if the felt has fallen off the bottom of your machine, mm -hmm. um, obviously that's there for a reason to, to help alleviate that. But sure, I mean, if you're running, you know, really heavy volume patterns, um, you're definitely going to get a little bit more fling than, than you normally would. And Especially on the flexes where those tanks and that, you know, yep. with that LDS up and, you know, that buffer brush being pretty close to the bottom of those sub tanks and tanks, um, you know, tend to get a little more, but... Yeah, I mean, on those too, that's where those adjustments of the roller and that transfer brush are because if that conditioner is building up in the brush per se and not getting off of everything, you're going to certainly see more um, what we would consider that sling than, Definitely. you know, getting to the to the actual lane. And um, the other thing is obviously chemicals. That you're yes, using. depending because on the, the conditioner you're using, yep. you might, some tend to string a little more yes. than others and, mm -hmm. and that's going to cause that as well so um there's a lot of factors that go into play but that's a good question as always i, I thought you were going to try to stump me somewhere don he might still appear <laughs> don's a good guy um what is the optimum psi for the oil pump so um i know we touched bases on this but just in case um you know, obviously on the machines that don't have the variable pump motors, we're looking at somewhere between 15 and 20 PSI. Um, that can obviously fluctuate a little bit with weather, um, which is why we try to stay in that range. And for the machines that, that do have the variable pump, we're looking at around 35 PSI for a 50 UL stream. Um, that gives us our range to be able to go from 60, you know, down to 30 or 20. All right. I think that's it for the questions. Perfect. Well, again, thank you, everyone. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, you got some good information. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on the next go around coming soon. Perfect. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Join the next one. Salute.